Hey guys, it's Sandro here, and today's video is going to be a bit of a guide on machine wet sanding car paint. But I'll also be briefly covering compounding and polishing so you can see the whole process from start to finish. Now there's several reasons and methods as to why and how you can sand automotive paint, such as for spot or isolated scratch removal, orange peel removal, dry sanding and hand sanding, many of which I've shown in past videos. So my focus today will be machine wet sanding on larger or whole areas of badly scratched and weathered automotive paint. And yes, there's more to it when you're sanding an entire vehicle and dealing with risky body lines and panel edges. But the best starting point is understanding the fundamentals of good sanding technique, machine sanders, sanding disc types and grits, as well as your wetting agent and how it all influences your results, which is what my main focus will be here today. In front of me I have some badly damaged paint with some significant scratches in a few areas which I'll be using for this demonstration. But just before we get to it, I'm going to try and firstly start by looking at machines. You can really use a variety of dual action polishers or dedicated automotive sanders to wet sand car paint. And ideally for someone who does this a lot, you'd have a whole selection of them to address different situations of sanding. But the main difference between all of them is size and motion. So your larger 5 or 6 inch machines that take larger discs are obviously going to be more efficient sanders for the larger flatter panels. While your smaller 3, 2 and 1 inch machines are going to be more efficient and safer options around intricate edges, areas and body lines. But that's just one part of the equation. What actually determines a sander's aggression, apart from the sanding disc size, is its action and orbital throw. So your more standard and dedicated body shop sanders with 3 to 9mm orbital throws will be less aggressive than your more standard 12 to 21mm throw dual action polishers. Additionally, many sanders just oscillate, while dual action sanders or polishers both oscillate and spin which again makes them more aggressive, which can be a good or bad thing depending on what's needed and what you're trying to achieve with each specific paint. So for example, if you're working on a softer paint and just wanting to lightly sand or refine the paint, then a 3mm orbital throw sander is a great choice. But when working on harder paint to remove more significant defects, a larger throw dual action sander is going to be a much more efficient machine to address that situation. But I'll also mention that if you use dual action polishers on speeds 1 or 2, they won't tend to spin on those lower speeds and just oscillate. So you can also use them in a less aggressive manner if you wish. And lastly, there's a myth that larger dual action polishers create more pigtail sanding scratches, which is untrue. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Pigtails occur when the clear coat clumps up under the sanding disc. When you use a larger orbital throw dual action polisher, it actually pushes and spins that residue off the sanding disc more efficiently due to its aggressive action, while that residue tends to accumulate on smaller throw orbital sanders. So as long as you understand that you're going to remove the paint at a faster rate with a more aggressive sander, which basically means that you sand for less time, I guarantee that you're less likely to get any pigtails in the finish with a good, clean working method. Next is sanding discs. Now obviously the more grits or abrasives you have, the finer they are. So a 3000 grit disc is much finer and less aggressive than a 300 grit sanding disc. When it comes to approaching car paint from a detailer's perspective, 1500 to 3000 grit is usually what we tend to use to address most situations. But in some cases, on harder paints, you may want to go down to 1200 grit and even up to 5000 grit, depending. The punched out holes you see in some sanding discs are generally for extracting dust during dry sanding. But depending on the specific brand of disc, some are solely for dry sanding, some are just for wet sanding and others can be used for both. You'll also notice that some discs have a paper thin appearance and texture, while others have a more fabric or textured look to them. This basically comes down to the individual sanding technology that each of these brands offer, which is a personal preference. The other consideration is interface foam. The Sia sanding discs I'll be using today have an integrated foam, which not only acts to lower and evenly disperse the aggression, but it also gives you a margin of error if your technique isn't perfect. 
but if your discs don't have integrated foam, and if you're new to machine sanding, I'd strongly suggest using an interface pad, as although it will reduce your aggression, it's far more forgiving to work with. Lastly is your wetting agent. I'll just be using water, which is absolutely fine, but just say I wanted to reduce my aggression, I could increase my lubrication by adding something like a few drops of wash detergent to my water, or even using a general lubricant, waterless wash, or quick detailer. So again, it really depends on what's needed. So if I find that the paint is soft and I'm removing too much paint before I even get a good consistent finish, some increased lubrication would be a great option. But if the paint is hard and the defects are severe, then I don't want added lubrication as it's just gonna slow me down. The other important part is the amount of solution you spray on. Too little and it will almost dry up instantly, leading to a jumpy machine motion as the liquid and paint begins to clump up. But too much liquid and you're just not gonna allow the sanding disc to cut effectively as it just slides without being able to sand consistently. Generally, a few light mists is a good starting point but you can always increase or decrease the amount depending on the ambient temperature, your choice of machine, sanding disc, the paint type, and your technique, all of which are going to influence how much liquid and what liquid you should be using. So let's get to doing a sanding test part to see what it's gonna to take to remove these defects. I'll be using my three inch 12 millimeter throw dual action shine mate polisher with a 2000 grit CS sanding disc for this demonstration. But you could certainly use a six inch polisher or sander and disc if you're sanding over a large flat area. I'll set my machine speed to three or the minimum speed I can use that'll still keep the backing plate spinning. I'll mist my liquid over my section, which is about a square foot in size but if I was using a larger disc, I'd also work a larger section. And I'll just do a single row of passes to start with. I'm using zero pressure with just the weight of the machine. And I'm also using a moderate arm speed, which is a little quicker than what I'd normally use when just compounding or polishing paint. The main thing you wanna focus on is keeping the sanding disc as flat to the paint as possible, which gives you the most uniform finish. But that's also where the foam and interface pad comes in, as if you slightly tilt the polisher so it's not completely flat, the foam will be your margin of error to help compensate for a slightly imperfect technique, which we all have. Once I'm done, I'll spray my disc with water to flush it clean, and I'll also spray a little water on the panel to help lubricate it when I'm wiping it down. When I'm inspecting my results, I'll firstly look for a good uniform finish, which I seem to have, meaning that the sanding marks are consistent and not patchy or irregular. I'll then look to see if I've been able to remove or reduce the existing defects to a satisfactory level that I'm happy with. Now, it's important to understand that a few of the scratches on this panel have actually gone through the clear coat, so I won't be able to fully remove them but I still should be able to make them far less noticeable with the right amount of sanding, and I should be able to remove the rest of the lighter to more moderate scratches that are still contained within the clear coat. But I will need to sand a little more in order to remove or minimize those scratches to the point that they won't be noticeable. Now, it's obviously important to know how much paint or clear coat you have to work with before you sand, and I also know that you guys are always interested to know how much clear coat is being removed during any paint correction process. Now, in most cases, it's just so little that it's not a measurable amount. But as it stands, I'm getting readings from about 190 to 170 microns on average on both the sanded and unsanded paints. But I'll continue to take readings and we'll see if there is a measurable difference once I'm done. So seeing that my choice of machine, sanding disc and lubrication has worked quite well, but I still need a little more leveling or cutting ability, I basically stuck to the same technique, but did two row passes this time on the lower part of the panel. Now, how many passes you should do will depend on the paint type and your combination of machine, disc and technique. 
and of course, how deep those scratches are to start with. So if the paint is soft, you generally want to stick to one or two passes at most because you're lifting the clear coat at a more rapid rate. So if you sand for too long, it will lead to pigtails in the finish as the clear coat begins to clump and harden on your disc. But when the paint or clear coat is harder, you generally have to sand for a little longer in order to remove the same amount of clear coat due to the paint's hardness. And as I mentioned, it also depends on your machine, sandpaper, grit and technique. So based on what I'm seeing here, two passes of my machine in total is as long as I should sand in one go to avoid pigtails, which as I mentioned are basically machine induced scratches that are deep and difficult to remove. But you'll see once I'm done that I didn't even create a single pigtail on the paint because I worked clean and didn't sand for too long at a time. Now inspecting the results, I can see once again that I've got good uniform sanding marks, but I can also see a few of those deeper scratches that could benefit further from perhaps one more set of passes. Taking a few more measurements, I can also see that the readings may be a few microns or so lower than the unsanded paint, which may be about right as to how much clear coat I've removed so far. Now back to the first top section, I did another two row sanding passes, which is now three passes in total. And it's looking as though about four passes in total with this specific combination on this paint is about the point where I'm going to get the best results possible. As like I mentioned before, a couple of their scratches have gone through the clear, so I can only reduce their appearance and not entirely remove them. So to finish off sanding, I did one more set of two passes on the lower part of the panel followed by one more set of a single row of passes on the top part of the panel. So that way both sections had a consistent finish and uniform material removal consisting of four machine passes in total. And that's another consideration, especially when you get into higher end work and results, that ideally you want the most consistent and uniform finish as possible across the board. Whereas sometimes if you're just addressing an isolated scratch, your goal might be to preserve as much paint or clear coat as possible rather than sacrificing the surrounding paint at the expense of a more consistent finish throughout. But that's just a choice each of us can make on our own depending on our needs and wants. So being that I've removed 90% plus of the original defects and that the remaining ones have been reduced to an acceptable level, the next step is refining these 2000 grit sanding marks with some finer sanding marks that will be easier to compound out. For this I'm using a 4000 grit SIA sanding disc, but the general rule is to double your grit grade when refining sanding marks. So if I used 1500 to start with, then I would have used 3000 in this second refinement stage. Now as far as technique goes, my technique will be quite similar here. But as I already know that refining coarser sanding marks usually takes longer than creating them, I'm going to start with two row passes instead of one. It's also important to note that this second refinement stage isn't about removing defects like the first stage. It's all about reducing and refining those primary sanding marks. And one of the biggest mistakes beginners do is not sanding enough in this second refinement stage. Having a look at the results, I can see that I've removed most of the 2000 grit sanding marks with just two passes of my machine. And I can also see that the paint looks a touch clearer and less foggy, which is also what you should be looking for. However, I can still see a few of the coarser sanding marks still remaining, so I will need to sand a little more in order to completely remove them. So all in all, I discovered that I needed four row passes in total to remove the coarser 2000 grit sanding marks, but I also decided to do this in two steps. As I could see that after just two passes, even with this finer grit sanding disc, it was about as much as I could sand in one go without risking pigtail scratches in the finish. So although you may be tempted to continue sanding for longer, my advice is that you're better off doing a couple of shorter sanding steps instead of a single longer one.
So being satisfied that all the coarser sanding marks have been removed and all I have left is the finer 4000 grit ones, the next step is compounding the paint to remove those finer sanding marks and begin to restore gloss. For this I'm using the Rupes Miller Polisher with the Lake Country Microfiber Polishing Pad and the Last Cut Plus Compound. I'm going to set my machine speed to 5, use moderate pressure and a slowish arm movement, doing 3 row passes which should hopefully be a good combination and technique to completely remove those sanding marks. Now exactly how difficult sanding marks are to remove will depend on the grit of the sanding paper, the hardness of the paint and the combination of pad, compound and machine you use. So it can vary quite a lot. But if it's 3000 grit or finer sanding marks and you make sure you remove any of the coarser sanding marks, it shouldn't be too difficult to remove them. I'll then use an IPA panel white product to remove any polishing oils before inspecting my results. Now inspecting my results, I can see that all the sanding marks have been removed with ease. But you really have to make sure that they have been all removed at this stage, as you don't want to move on to your final finishing combination until they are all eliminated. Now in most cases when compounding paint, you will see some noticeable haze, which is completely normal, and which requires a final finishing stage of polishing to truly restore gloss and clarity. For this I'm using Envy Finesse Polish on the Lake Country Orange SDO foam pad. I'm going to drop my machine speed down to 3, just use light pressure and more of a moderate arm speed, doing 3 quickish passes. So basically this is a gentle combination of products and technique that is focused on finishing paint and amplifying gloss, depth and clarity. Now as we have a look at the finished results, hopefully you guys will see just what an amazing result and difference was achieved. Not only to remove the existing scratches, but to also transform the paint into something that looks fantastic. If you look closely, you can still see the remains of a couple of those deeper scratches, but quite honestly, unless you know they are there and you're using some really good lighting, it's actually really difficult to spot them. So taking some final paint measurements, it's again hard to get a precise reading on exactly how much clear coat was removed during this whole process. But if I had to guess based on the readings, I'd say approximately 10 microns or so is a fair estimate. As mentioned at the start of this video, it's hard to cover all the different aspects of sanding in a single video, but I hope this video was helpful and useful to some of you out there. As always, please share this video, like, comment and subscribe to this channel to show your support for this content and I'll see you guys soon.